Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are going to start a new chapter. This is a very important chapter in Rook. This is chapter 103. And this is the dermatosis resulting from disorders of veins and arteries. Since it's a big chapter, I have divided this chapter into uh, three or maybe four lectures. So today, our topic will comprise of three different arterial diseases. That is the peripheral vascular disease, the Burgess disease and erythromyalgia. I am Brigadier Retired Usher Ahmed Mashood and I am Professor of Dermatology and Aesthetic Medicine. You can follow me on Instagram, email, and WhatsApp. So let's start from uh, arterial and arterial disorders. Before we discuss the arterial and arterial disorders, we will discuss um, briefly about the vasculogenesis and angiogenesis. The vasculogenesis is a process by which endothelial cells differentiate and leads to the formation of primary capillary plexus and occurs mainly in embryonal stage. So most of the blood vessels or major blood vessels are formed at the embryonal stage. And this is the stage of vasculogenesis when the different endothelial cells, uh, they differentiate and form the vessels. Angiogenesis is a process by which new capillaries are formed from the existing vessels by sprouting, expanding, and remodeling. This is a pivotal part, this plays a pivotal part in wound healing, but is also a key element in pathogenesis of certain diseases. In angiogenesis, the endothelial cells are under the influence of angiogenic stimuli, the vascular endothelial growth factors A, B, C, and D, and E, plus placental growth factor, which permits the migration of budding endothelial cells and formation of new blood vessels. So the two terms should be differentiated, the vasculogenesis and angiogenesis. Vasculogenesis is formation of new blood capillaries and vessels from endothelial cells in embryonal stage. And angiogenesis is the same process which occurs in adult, and it is an ongoing process which occurs in a wound healing and may develop pathologically in certain tumors or other states. As the angiogenesis occurs, it differentiates into arteries, veins, and capillaries. While the local tissue ischemia or hypoxia stimulates angiogenesis, arteriogenesis is mainly influenced by inflammation and the sheer local stress. So formation of new arteries is always by as a result of inflammation and stress. Peripheral vascular disease. It is a very important topic and there will be many important details which you will be coming across during this talk. It is a very important condition as far as the examination is concerned. You can get a patient of peripheral vascular disease in which you have to uh, get many details in the history and uh, uh, determine, detect very important signs in the examination. Peripheral vascular disease are the disorders where the arterial blood supply to the limb, which is usually the leg, is damaged by atherosclerosis that results in intravascular thrombosis that leads to damage and death of the tissue. So if the blood flow to the tissue or peripheral tissue is reduced, then first it will lead to ischemia and then it will lead to necrosis or death of the tissue. This Atherosclerosis is responsible for more than 90% of all arterial diseases in Western world and affect 5% of men over 50 years of age. And among the 5% of the men which are affected by the peripheral vascular disease, 
10% develop critical limb ischemia. Atherosclerosis may present to dermatologists. It can present to vascular surgeons, to general surgeons, to medical specialists, but it will present to dermatologists when peripheral ischemia will lead to infarction or ulceration of the skin. Apart from diabetes, tobacco smoking is one of the most important risk factors for arterial disease. So these two conditions, that is diabetes and smoking, in addition, a family history of arterial disease and presence of hyperlipidemia are two other factors. So in total, there are four important factors which you would like to exclude in the history. That is the presence of diabetes, presence of hyperlipidemia, family history of arterial disease and tobacco smoking. Clinical features. The history is important and you would like to ask about the cramping pain on walking, which is called as the claudication. And this cramping pain occurs on posterior calf and is relieved by taking rest. Then there may be rest pain at night, usually in the foot. This is an indication of critical limb ischemia. In initial stages, this rest pain would not occur. And then finally, skin ulcerations, which are uh, smaller and punched out and, and start from the toes. Presentation can be variable. Uh, there can be erythematous or dusky mottled hue to the legs, as seen on the left side of the picture. And on elevation of the leg, the leg would turn into white, which is called as the white foot. Then there will be trophic changes since there is a decrease in blood flow to the skin because of ischemia in the blood vessels, ischemia due to the obstruction in blood vessels, the skin will become dry, it would crack, there will be loss of hairs and the nails would be thickened. So this dryness, fissuring, loss of hair and thick nail are described as the trophic skin changes. Then, the plated emboli, that is small thrombi, can lodge in the vasculature, small vessels causing areas of discoloration in toes and sole of the foot. And this is a um, um, levidoid or reticular pattern or vasculitic-like lesions which develop on the peripheral uh, part of the feet. Then in the end stage, there will be ulceration on the skin and they can be on the pressure point and dorsum of the foot. The ulcer is clean and punched out if it is not secondarily infected. Claudication. Claudication is a medical term which is uh, referred to impairment in walking or pain, discomfort and numbness or tiredness in the leg that occur during walking or standing and it is relieved by the rest. The word claudication comes from the Latin word claudicare means to limp. The most common uh, place to develop the claudication are, is in the calves but can be in the feet, thigh, hip, buttock, or in the arms. Intermittent claudication. It is most often referred to the cramping pain in the buttock or leg muscles, especially calves, due to peripheral arterial disease. The differential diagnosis of peripheral arterial disease is the Burgess disease, emboli leading to acute ischemia, external arterial compression, that is popliteal entrapment or cervical rib, then dissecting aneurysms, ergot alkaloid poisoning, coagulation disorders like polycythemia and thrombocytosis, and finally vasculitis, different kind of medium or large vessel vasculitis. How would you classify the severity of peripheral arterial disease? It is classified as mild, moderate, and severe on the basis of ankle, brachial, doppler pressure index. 
we can measure it uh, by stethoscope uh, like a normal blood pressure but uh, can be more um, objectively measured by the doppler so the normal would be one if the ratio of brachial to ratio of um, uh, ankle to brachial uh, blood pressure systolic blood pressure is one then it is normal if the ratio is 0.71 to 0.9, then it is the mild peripheral vascular disease. If the ratio, uh, that is ankle blood pressure is less than the brachial blood pressure. If it is further reduced, that is ratio is 0.41 to 0 0.70, then it would be a moderate peripheral vascular disease. Further decrease in blood pressure and ratio to less than 0.41 would uh, call it as severe peripheral vascular disease. And if the blood pressure is less than 0.2, if the, sorry, if the brachial, uh, ankle brachial index pressure is less than 0.2, it is severe ischemia and will definitely lead to gangrene. There are several comorbidity morbidities which are associated with peripheral arterial disease. The first and foremost is the cigarette smoking, then um, hypertension, we have mentioned about hyperlipidemia and diabetes, obesity, the poor lifestyle, a family history of cardiovascular disease, then history of uh, cardiovascular pathologies like atrial fibrillation and other dysrhythmias or murmurs, heart failure, aortic aneurysm and brewy over the stenose vessels, then fundi may show hypertensive changes and cholesterol, emboli, and peripheral neuropathy. So these all are the comorbidities. And in the examination of such patients, you have to examine the CVS in detail, especially to find any sign of fibrillation or uh, dysrhythmia or murmurs, and uh, find if the heart sounds are normal or feeble, then um, try to find brui over the aorta, then fundal, ex fundal ex examination and the uh, peripheral neurological examination. Treatment options for claudication. So the, this is the early stage of peripheral vascular disease when patients only complain of pain while walking and especially in calves and buttocks and thigh. And uh, in such case, the first line is definitely stop smoking, treat hypertension, treat diabetes, and treat hyperlipidemia. Then there will be a supervised exercise program to try to encourage the development of collateral blood vessels. And antiplatelet agents should be given like uh, uh, clopidogrel and aspirin. If these measures are not sufficient, then in second line, we go for angioplasty and stenting. The potential complication of angioplasty and stenting is arterial rupture, aneurysm formation, further thrombosis and dissection. The third line treatment is infra-inguinal bypass surgery using autologous veins whenever possible for people with intermittent, severe intermittent claudication. Nefty drofural oxalate is a selective antagonist of 5-HT2 receptor. It acts as a vasodilator and enhance cellular oxidative capacity. This is a new and advanced therapy which should be given for patient when the usual therapies are not effective. Then the treatment for patients who have pain at the rest uh, and having signs of gangrene and acute limb ischemia. So now the aim should be to relieve the pain, to preserve the life of the limb and prevent amputation. At this time, the first line becomes urgent angiography to confirm the critical uh, vessel where the obstruction is there. If embolic, if it is embolic, then balloon angioplasty with or without stenting is sufficient, but sometimes percutaneous laser, uh, atherectomy and thrombolysis and anticoagulation is required. If it is stenotic, then thrombolysis often via intra-arterial catheter followed by anticoagulant. 
and later on angioplasty stenting and surgery may be necessary plated emboli should be managed by antiplatelet medication and if everything fails then we have to resort to the amputation now the second disease which i am going to discuss today is the thromboangitis obliterans popularly known as the burgess disease this is a non atherosclerotic segmental inflammatory disease of small and medium sized arteries of distal extremities of predominantly young male smokers so in this uh, three liner there were several important point, important uh, words which uh, requires your attention the first is that thromboangitis obliterans is a non atherosclerotic disease previously we discussed the peripheral arterial disease due to atherosclerosis but burgess disease is non atherosclerotic disease and it is probably due to segmental inflammation of the blood vessels and it involves small and medium sized arteries mainly involving the distal extremities and the segment of population on which this disease affects most are the male young smokers these patients present to dermatologist with erythema or ulceration of the skin of fingers and toes mostly they are young and under 40 as the smoking is rising in women the number of women patients is also increasing the prevalence of burgess disease is high in middle east in india in far east and it is thought to reflect the smoking habits more than the ethnicity so this a uh, hand uh, drawing is taken from the net and it shows certain features of burgess disease the first is the young male smoker here then on the skin it shows the formation of ulcers painful painful blue fingers and even amputations and on a uh, angiogram a typical cork screw collaterals are seen this is typical of burgess disease pathology circulating anti endothelial cell antibodies are present in high titer in the active disease the full thickness of vessel wall is invaded by lymphocytes eosinophils plasma cells and monocytes which disrupts the internal elastic lamina there is the luminal occlusion from thrombosis which is highly cellular so the inflammation which develops within the vessel wall leads to thrombosis and uh, occlusion of the vessels all changes are segmental or focal so they are not diffuse at a later stage of disease fibrosis may occur and which involves the surrounding structure there is no confirmed genetic basis of this disease the clinical features in the history there will be a pain in upper and lower limb with cold extremities there will be history of intermittent claudication especially in the arch of the foot there will be rest pain as well there will be neuropathic pain and increased sensitivity to cold now uh, the presentation presentation can be in a form of ulcers at the site of trauma and often the sides of nail or the tip of digits are affected there will be gangrene developing early trophic changes will be there the peripheries will be red and cyanotic there will be edema in addition there can be venous thrombosis and thrombophilobitis migrans proximal pulses are present but dorsalis pedis posterior tibial and brachial pulses are lost early so here you can see the small ulcers at the tip of the toes 
along with the blue um, fingers, uh, the dusky and cyanotic fingers with small ulceration at the tip of the digits. This is the advanced gangrene. Uh, this big toe needs amputation and even the second toe also requires amputation. Investigation. There is no diagnostic test, but angiography shows arterial occlusion and development of corkscrew collaterals. These are the corkscrew collaterals. The ESR may be elevated and blood tests should be undertaken to exclude the collagen vascular disease and coagulation abnormalities. Ma the management. The first line management is definitely cessation of smoking. And this is only an intervention which is of a proven value. The second uh, line management is the surgical, which is the revascularization if possible, as most occlusions are not amenable because they are too distal, too distal or diffuse and segmental. So unlike the peripheral vascular disease, the surgical intervention is not very effective in Burgess disease because the obstruction is too distal, diffuse and segmental. So most of the cases, it ends with amputation um, when gangrene sets in. The medical managements include prostacycline analog infusions, calcium channel blockers, the thrombolytics and anticoagulants. Sympathectomy is of value uh, with spinal cord stimulators and stimulating angiogenesis through autologous bone marrow cell rich in endothelial progenitor cells. The third disease which I am going to discuss today is erythromyalgia. Erythromyalgia is derived from Greek words erythros mean red, milos mean limb, and algos means pain. It's a rare neurovascular disorder in which extremities are episodically painful and red. The sensation of burning is associated with vasodilation of small blood vessels in the affected area. So here you are seeing vasodilatation rather than vascular occlusion. The painful burning attacks typically affect the hands or feet, but may involve face and ears. It may be primary idiopathic or hereditary. Hereditary is seen in 15% of patients with mutation is in SCNA9A gene, or it can be secondary to thrombocythemia and polycythemia. It can be primary idiopathic, hereditary, or secondary to thrombocythemia and polycythemia. Median age of onset ranges from 5 to 91 years with slight female predominance. The condition is poorly understood and treatment is often unsuccessful. Pathophysiology First, let's discuss about the primary erythromyalgia. Erythromyalgia is the first condition in which an ion channel mutation has been associated with chronic pain. Ten mutations in SCN9A gene are identified. These mutations alter the activation profile to produce channels that are open for a longer period of time, leading to more prolonged changes in membrane potentials. So all the uh, trouble is in the ion channels, which remain open for a prolonged period of time because of the mutations leading to increased membrane potential. This hyperexcitability of C fibers due to, uh, due to increased membrane potential in the dorsal root ganglion leads to the burning pain that characterizes erythromyalgia. In the sympathetic system, there is hyporeactivity. 
resulting in altered vascular response to stimuli such as heat and exercise, which cause persistent vasodilatation of the affected skin. So, usually the heat and exercise cause vasodilatation, but sympathetic system is hyporeactive and this vasodilatation is for a prolonged period of time. It is unknown why the pain episodes uh, are associated with erythromyalgia occur mainly in hands and feet. Then secondary erythromyalgia. These are the cases that are associated with thrombocythemia and biopsies reveal arteriolar fibrosis and vascular occlusion due to platelet thrombi. It is thought that the abnormally functioning platelets in thrombocythemia clump in the vessel and induce neurovascular damage by triggering the inflammation. Pathology. There is no diagnostic histopathological findings. Causative organisms. The cause is unknown, but pox, pox virus were isolated from throat swabs of several patients. However, this association is not confirmed. Genetics. When familial, it's inherited as autosomal dominant manner. Environmental factor. Eating certain fungi such as cytosyb, acromyalgia, um, it's, a, it's in the Japan, consumed in Japan, lead to uh, reports of mushroom-induced erythromyalgia, which persists for up to five months. In medication-induced erythromyalgia, calcium channel blockers and bromocriptine trigger the condition. Clinical features. There is intense burning associated with erythema and increased warmth of the extremities, mainly hand, feet, arm, legs, face or ears. Trigger of attack are heat, movement, exercise and emotional distress. Attacks last for few months to several hours. During the attack, patients are desperate to cool the affected area because of the excessive heat that is felt in these areas. During the attack, the affected part is very red. Initially between the attacks, the affected part appears normal but over the time, the dusky discoloration and acrocyanosis persists and skin becomes shiny. Complications and comorbidities. Skin changes such as irritant dermatitis, fissuring, secondary to chronic immersion in cold water to relieve the heat symptom is one of the commonest complications of this condition. Then the vascular occlusion may lead to ulceration, necrosis, and gangrene. In secondary erythromyalgia, tendency to avoid using the affected limb lead to edema and atrophy. Then there will be psychological issues due to chronic pain. Disease course and prognosis. Secondary erythromyalgia due to myeloproliferative disease will respond if underlying condition is treated successfully. Primary erythromyalgia is a chronic disorder and is generally unremitting. Investigation. Blood tests should be done to exclude polycythemia, thrombocythemia, collagen vascular disease, gout, and diabetes. Nerve conduction studies should be done to rule out peripheral neuropathy of other causes. Then management. If due to myeloproliferative disease, refer to a hematologist, aspirin for thrombocythemia, Avoid, advise on avoiding exacerbating factors. Advise patient against cold water immersion to relieve symptoms. Neuropathic pain is relieved by amitriptyline, gabapentine, pregabalin, and mexiletine. The psychological support is necessary and lidocaine patch and refer to pain special clinic. So this brings to end of today's uh, lecture. See you next time with the diseases of veins. Thank you very much and goodbye and have a very good day.